history and accounting from Penn State, right? That's correct. And an associate applied science degree in fire technology from the Lakeland Community College. That's Mentor, isn't it? Yes, Ohio. it is. And a Bachelor of Science in Fire Administration from the University of Cincinnati, summa cum laude, I believe, correct? Yes. And he's now working for a master's degree in public administration at Cleveland State. Am I correct? I got that. He also uh, has uh, fire technology training, other fire uh, technology training, as well as having been an adjunct faculty member at both Lakeland and the Ohio Fire Academy. He's a certified emergency medical technician. He is a airplane pilot, and along with banking uh, and part-time firefighting in Pennsylvania, he's also seen service as a crash rescue specialist in the Pennsylvania Air National Guard. He uh, has, in 1979 to 82, he was a custom service consultant uh, for the Champion Service Corporation in Cleveland, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. And that was a savings and loan, was it? Type that of was thing? a savings loan and banking. And banking. Uh, from eight, 1982 to 94, he's been the chief training officer and safety officer with the Willoughby, Ohio Fire Department. And I had to go over to the side here to get all this in. In 1979 to 94, part-time battalion chief and emergency medical uh, and hazardous material officer for the Mentor Fire Department as well. He became chief here just, what, two months ago, was it? October 17th. Uh, October 17th. And so we certainly welcome you not only to this program, but to, uh, to Oberlin. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the first question I think that we really need to determine here is how did you get from banking into fire service? Well, that's a lot longer than a 30-minute explanation. <laughs> but certainly, um, it, it goes back to my original degree, and my original interest was in business, and I needed to major in business, so I majored in accounting. Mm -hmm. So graduating from my first degree in university, looking for that inevitable first career move into an actual job, I started into the banking industry. And in the meantime, I had also simultaneously become a volunteer fireman, kind of a long family tradition and uh, eventually made a transition after moving to Cleveland, had opportunity to get into the full-time fire service, of which in Pennsylvania, the original hometown, there was not that type of an opportunity. So I had the opportunity, uh, it was exciting and challenging enough to me, and I made the jump. Great. That's fascinating. But you sort of went into it and out of it, didn't you? Well, not, not really. Not it was really? a gradual transition. I it, I felt very comfortable with the move because I, I did have higher aspirations at the time and I thought that administration and fire service was very much parallel to business management and uh, the move was very comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. And that made the transition gradual and, and came from banking to working with people at the Cleveland organization and then to make that actual move into the fire service mm -hmm. and working with people all the time. So oh, I'm sure the city uh, will be pleased that your banking experience will help you keep your budget in line. And, oh, I'm, uh, sure that, <laughs> I'm sure that they will. <laughs> um, my second question is, what was there or is there about the chief's position here that attracted you to apply? Well, it's, it's more the location than the total position. Uh, there were two key items that were very much of interest to me when I looked over the Oberlin position, one being the location. Mm -hmm. And it's what I would consider after uh, contemplation and looking into it and identifying the beautiful place that Oberlin really is, and much to my dismay having not been here sooner, mm -hmm. just for my own personal pleasure, uh, really thought it was the place to be. Small city uh, with a lot of 1990s and future look looking ahead. Uh, they're a very aggressive management style. I like the um, the overall style of management in the city. I felt very comfortable with the city manager council alternative that you have as opposed to the mayor council mm -hmm. that I have worked with in the past. And I, I felt that they had very good goals that were well oriented to my own mm -hmm. and to what I could bring a fire department into. So I might add that uh, this chief has a, 
is setting a historical record of being the first chief, I think, in the Oakland Department who came from outside. I think in the past, over many, many years, they have risen through the ranks. And so uh, you're, you're, new, you're setting a precedent in, in that way. What are your impressions now of the Oakland community in this uh, two months you've been with us? It's more pleasurable and more exciting than I had first even imagined. Um, everyone has been so friendly. They've been welcoming me with um, very positively. Been extremely cooperative from administration, uh, city manager, the city offices, down through council, and, and actually into the business and the residential community. Everyone I have have met has had occasion to meet to this point has been friendly, uh, very cooperative, and uh, it just makes it more enjoyable to look look ahead to that that uh, business and social arrangement. Uh, as it's been very positive. I've now been fortunate enough to move into the area and now I can enjoy it 24 hours a day. Okay. Well, did it take you very long to learn the streets and where things are? Um, where are we? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Tell me a little bit about the fire department in Oberland. Or tell our viewers about it. Um, perhaps first, um, the general organization, the number of full-time people, part-time, how that breaks okay. down. Well, the Overland Fire Department is a, what is known in the business as a combination fire department. And being a combination department, uh, we're really giving a, a major benefit to the community of having the best of both. Uh, the best in that we have full-time personnel. Uh, in addition to myself, we have three additional fire department drivers that serve on a 24-hour basis at the fire station. Now these individuals come in uh, one person per shift, and the shift is 24 hours long. The individual resides at the fire station during that time period, and they are generally the person who answers the phones, uh, takes care of all the emergency incoming calls, and starts to respond to first fire apparatus to the incident. Uh, we are complemented by another exceptional group of part-time personnel. The part-time personnel right now number about 22, and uh, these are a fine group of men and women in a department that, that also hold some rankings in officer positions that come of their own time uh, when we do have a call, and they supplement that initial response person that we have. So we have the benefit of having an individual ready to respond to bring an apparatus to a location, and it's generally met on location by a, a number of these men and women ready to go to work and handle the emergency as accordingly. Now they're called by beepers, is that right? Right, We're, we are notified, uh, again, by the individual on duty. He receives a call and he notifies them by telephone, and uh, this is an unusual telephone situation. He makes one call and it notifies all simultaneously. And then additionally by radio beepers for those mm -hmm. that do not happen to be at their home residence. Mm -hmm. So that's simultaneous, is it, pretty much? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. Notification will generally take about 30 seconds. Some people have asked recently, what happened to the fire siren? We still have it, but we don't use it for fire. We have it. Anymore. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's set up there for disaster warning, uh, specifically to tornado warnings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you hear that, I would not be out looking for the fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd be looking for shelter. We, uh, some people sort of miss it. That took sort of the excitement out of the out of fires, but probably as a move into the future. So yes, we have to do move. We have to move ahead. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the equipment. Well, the equipment is it expands a it spans a lot of years. Uh, we have some very good equipment, uh, but like anything, technology moves on sometimes. We are fortunate to have eight pieces of apparatus in the Oberlin Fire Department and. Uh, been very fortunate in the past to have the type of apparatus that we needed to handle the situations that were were presented to the firefighters on at emergency incidents. Uh, we have two emergency uh, pumping engines. We have an aerial tower platform, uh, which is the oldest piece within the department. We have a service vehicle that carries our additional equipment. We have a rescue unit, a grass fire truck, and we have a water tanker and a small personnel vehicle. And that equipment is all housed at our fire station location on South Main Street. Well, it's impressive for a town this size, though, isn't it? Yes, it is. But again, we, we need to look at the variety of situations we need to face. And we do provide some fire protection to part of Russia Township. And accordingly, we have to have the proper type equipment to handle that. So that encompasses some type of 
rescue vehicle, also the uh, water tanker shuttle due to the lack of water facilities, and also the grass fire units because we have more open country out there than we really have within the inner city. Mm -hmm. Now, am I correct that in some instances you would take certain apparatus to a fire that you might not take somewhere else given whatever the location was? I mean, would, you, would something in the business district uh, bring a better, bigger turnout than, say, to my house? So. Yes, we do kind of, we, we do change our responses depending on exactly where within the city we go to. We look in advance, what we call pre-planning, different types of zones or districts, and we are um, acute to looking what type of structures or buildings, what type of uh, life hazards are the people living or residing or working at those locations, and how we can best address those particular responses. Mm -hmm. Such in, in the downtown area, we have a lot of businesses that are, that are right up against each other. They're close in. Some of the structures are, are the better known. They've been there for a while. And they're interconnected in different ways and mazes that we need to be more concerned about the, the fast spread of fire and, and hazard to other people in the area. So we'll respond to different larger apparatus. We use the tower apparatus for that. We can put the ladders closer in. We have large need for water capacity and for laddering to get up and around inside buildings, as opposed to the country. Again, we get out to the country, we, we need to downsize a little bit, we need an engine, or we need to carry our water supply with us when we leave the city. And then we correspondingly we scale things according to other types of calls, car fires uh, or residential homes, where we don't need large ladders, but again, we need the personnel and certain type of equipment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Am I, let's see, I was going to put down here, and I think you sort of said it already. I said, am I correct in saying that Oberlin has an excellent fire department at present? I, my first impression, and, and at this particular time, is that Oberlin has an extremely well put together, well organized, and an excellent group of men and women operating in the fire service now. So that's a challenge for you to build on that base. That it, it's a challenge to take that and, and go even more beyond it, but it makes it extremely pleasurable to start at that level because we've covered the basics, mm -hmm. and now we can look beyond that. Which leads into my next question, which is, do you have some specific changes on, in mind that uh, you want to share with us at the moment? or? Well, we do have a few things coming down into uh, the near future. Um, we're looking at the organization of the fire department to better facilitate uh, how we handle certain type of calls. We're looking uh, within the first of the year to get into a uh, change of fire codes so we can best address the, the fire protection and the life hazards to the people and uh, living within us and uh, working within the city of Oberlin. And uh, we're hoping to get more involved actually out into the community, especially in the area of public education. I think we believe it or not, we're at break time already. And we would announce to the public that that number is 775-1635 if you have questions you'd like to put to our new chief. And he will be very pleased to try to answer them. We'll be back in just a minute or so. 23 years from now, Howard will excel in business presentation. Alice will apply her creative thinking to architecture. Joel will be a better team player at the office. And Nina will have learned to think on her feet. Kids learn a lot more than the arts from arts education. In Ohio, arts education means business. For more information, call 614-466-2613. Welcome back. And while wow, remember that phone number, 775-1635. In the meantime, let me um, ask if you would take us through what happens in an alarm. When an alarm comes in, let's say I call in and say I have a house fire, what happens? What's the, well, we hope, that, we hope that the alarm does come in through the 911 system. You prefer that rather we than prefer 911 the... rather than the fire department non-emergency number. We do get a lot of calls like that. But irrespective of how it comes in, the alarm is received at the fire station. The uh, on-duty dispatcher or, or the fire driver answers the call takes the information and we try to get as much information as possible and at which time he'll note the information he will use the telephone system to notify the firefighters that are at their homes and then immediately use the paging system 
the radio paging system to, to notify all the other firefighters that may not be at the residence, explaining to them the type of situation and uh, where the, what location it is at. Uh, the firefighter on duty then will drive the first unit, appropriate unit, to that particular location. Firefighters that generally live near that area go directly to the location of the call. And they do have their protective clothing, at which time they can dress and upon arrival of the driver with the apparatus go to work. Some other people that live on the opposite side of the city will, will pass by the fire station and pick up the additional apparatus and they will respond that to the location. Is there any particular information you hope people will give 911? Well, we hope that they will give us a location. Uh, we do, 911 is very well enhanced and it does give us location, but we like as much specifics without putting the people in hazard. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to stay in their home and do that. I would much prefer they leave the home go to a neighbor's house or go to another location nearby and make that emergency call, especially if they're in danger. We want them out of the house. We want to know if, any, if everyone is out of the home and whether or not people are trapped or injured mm -hmm. so that we can make arrangements for other additional help as mm -hmm. needed. But you'd like to know whether it's a car fire versus a house yes. fire? Yes, house fire, car fire, fire, or any particular rescue, motor vehicle accident, yes, we like I to know that. I guess the technical term is what, working fire? Is that oh, working skill? fire means, uh, yes. Yes. We will be there for and a while. And by the way, your, your, your predecessor, Chief Jones, taught me to say fire suppression and not fire fighting. <laughs> so I guess, is that still current? That's the 1990s. That's the 1990s. Okay. Uh, while we're waiting, hopefully, for a call, uh, one of the things we hear about is the frequency of alarm drops in Oberlin. Would you care to make any comment on that? Uh, well, yes, I'll make very positive comment on it. Most of the alarm drops that we receive are from uh, fire suppression systems that are built into some of the larger areas within the community, specifically at Oberlin College. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of structures there, the dormitories and some of the other halls. In fact, they're still in the process of bringing some of these things up to date as far as fire codes, and they have sprinklers, and that's where we get some of those calls. We have a phone call. Sure. We well, don't need that, do I? I'm forgetting how they go. Evening. You're on the air with Chief uh, Curran. Hi. How are you doing this evening? Good. Very Good. well. Um, I was wondering if the uh, Chief has any ideas for the uh, tornado or early warning systems or anything that they're having. Is there any special training or anything that he has that will help Oberlin in that uh, aspect of things. Do you mean in his background? Yes. In his distinguished background. Okay, we'll find out. Chief. Okay, and the early warning systems, uh, they do have a fairly decent uh, Doppler warning system in the Cleveland area. I'm familiar with that. I've, I've known I've done quite a bit of storm duty myself, and most recently, as much as this year, uh, we've had some pretty hard hit areas over in Willoughby and Euclid area, so we've dealt with that. Uh, we do have a good warning system uh, here within Overland, and I, I feel that we have a good connection with the early warning system so that we get as much notice as reasonably possible. And I think, I think that we're doing pretty well along that line. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for the call. Um, while we're talking about that, we have two sirens now, I think, don't we? But right now we have three. Oh, we have three we now. Have three Where, sirens. Where's the third? One's uh, out by Pyle Reservoir, one's over right. City Hall. And they have another one, I believe, up in this end. On this end, right. someplace. Okay, mm -hmm. that's... So if we hear that, we should take some kind of cover. Yes, I, I would definitely consider that to be a sighted mm -hmm. tornado. One, one uh, question I'd like to ask you uh, is how people join the Oberlin Fire Department. If there's somebody out here mm -hmm. tonight just itching That's to be a interested fire, how to they, join? How do they do it? Okay, the uh, part-time and full-time positions in the Oberlin Fire Department are civil service positions, which means that they are tested as uh, appointments become necessary to those positions. The um, part-time firefighter position is tested by a, a written examination and a uh, proficiency examination as far as physical agility, or I like to call it physical capabilities, mm -hmm. to make sure that the individual uh, has an idea of what type duties need to be done in that position. Mm -hmm. uh, the civil service exam really does not require any type of prior firefighter knowledge. It's, um, for the most part, general knowledge examination, just looking for the person's capability of reading comprehension and mathematical skills. Because as the person uh, passes the examination and successfully completes the 
the physical portion and they're put onto an appointed list or a, a ranking structure by that test order. And once they're hired in a part-time position, they receive all of their training within the Oberlin Fire Department. Mm -hmm. The training is according to uh, minimal standards and by certified instructors from the state of Ohio, the Ohio Fire Academy. And they will receive fire training and rescue training based on those standards. The uh, full-time positions are actually filled from part-time rankings. So an individual has to have completed at least 24 months of service as a part-time firefighter in order to qualify as a fire driver and to be eligible to sit for that examination and, and move into the full-time profession. Okay. Um, what uh, changes do you see in the offing for fire suppression in the next, say, 10, 15 years? You spoke earlier of this technology changing and our equipment needing to meet it. Are there any surprising things or drastic things, or is it more uh, subtle things that the public might not notice? I think it will be things that the public will definitely notice. Uh, we're, we're looking on a national level to bring the fire service into the 1990s and beyond. And that transition encompasses a lot of technology. There are discussions out there in testing and ongoing uh, certifications looking to as to whether or not we should look at these fire suppression systems that we have in major buildings of assembly like the college buildings and the, and the inn and several other locations, and maybe bringing those, those sprinkler systems on a smaller scale into the residential home, thereby enabling any type of, of incipient fire in a residential house to be, if not contained, maybe even extinguished prior to the fire service arrival. Uh, they're also pushing more on, on public awareness and public education, which is some of the areas that, that I want to delve into in the Oberlin area. I want to make sure that people are aware and educated of their alternatives and not just putting in sprinkler systems, but it's simplicity of smoke detectors mm -hmm. and, and how they can enhance their safety uh, personally, firsthand. We want to make that education available for them, enlighten them, and bring them up. This fire service in of itself is looking to go more from the suppression end of putting fires out and looking more towards actually preventing fires. And the shift has been on now for at least 10 years, and it's continuing in that direction. What um, do you see as possible hazards, hazard material problems for Oberlin? I'm assuming most of it would be some kind of an accident on 58 or something of that sort, something going through. Would that be right? Or? That's correct. We, we do have a lot of potential hazardous materials that come through the city. Uh, we, we have the well, simplicity of the can of gasoline for your lawnmower is a hazardous material. Mm -hmm. and it's just the remark on the personal level that a hazardous material can be anything that is not used the way it was designed for. Mm -hmm. We designed gasoline, was manufactured, and it's for your lawnmower, for your automobile, and not to take into a home and clean a carpet or clean a floor with. It's mm -hmm. not designed for that. So in that, that predicament, we can have a residential hazardous materials problem. But yes, we do have materials coming through. They have a federal level program that's now filtering down into the states where people have a right to know what is in their business and what's in their area. And, and now they're looking at that right to know along the lines of transportation. You have a right to know when certain things come through your community. Mm -hmm. And they're in the process of establishing that network to tell us when something is coming through of a significant hazardous nature. That's Encourage. We also have, don't we, um, mutual aid packs with surrounding cities, so, yes. including the hazardous waste. That's yes, we the do. County, don't yes, so. the county, Lorraine County, has uh, of itself a combination mutual aid agreement with all other departments. So we we have supply and receive mutual aid with all other Lorraine County departments, and even a few that are just over the county line. And uh, also part of that agreement would be the Lorraine County Hazardous Materials Team, mm -hmm. which is, uh, again, an additional benefit to Oberlin. We provide people who are trained to serve on that team, and the uh, units are purchased and stocked uh, by all participating fire departments and cities, supplying X, X amount of dollars according to their size and, and need. And uh, those people will respond upon our request to any large type hazardous material incident in Oberlin. We have another call.
Evening, you're on the air with our fire chief. Free smoke detectors. We're on, you're on the air with the fire chief. Yes, I'd like to know if um, you can give some smoke detectors to the residents free. Yes, uh, smoke detectors smoke to the detectors, residents free. That, that's a subject near and dear to my heart. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll give you a quick preview promotion of that. The Lorain County Fire Chiefs Association, or we call North Central Fire Chiefs, is in the process of arranging a joint effort with the Red Cross in the Elyria chapter. And uh, they are going to provide the communities in Lorain County with smoke detectors that will be available for free. And uh, the key to that is, is the accompanying short portion of public education that will uh, go with it. Well, we, we look at this in the Oberlin Fire Department as we will participate in the program. They will provide us with the smoke detectors sometime after the first of the year. And uh, we will make arrangements for anyone of need of that particular detector that receive one or more as appropriate for their type of residence for free. And we will arrange for the installation of that by fire department personnel. Okay, thank you. You're Thanks for the call. Uh, let me ask you, as we're getting toward the end of this, believe it or not, um, do you have any suggestions for fire safety in homes generally, and particularly at this Christmas season? Yes, this is uh, this is an unusual time, Christmas. We're all in a joyous giving mode, and uh, we're looking to. Um, spend time with friends, relatives, and loved ones, and certainly um, we are always looking to decorate and provide festive occasions. Uh, there's a tendency to do more cooking. There's a tendency this time of the year that uh, pretty soon I'm sure we'll get into our first significant snowfall, and uh, that will necessitate people bringing out uh, heating devices that they don't normally use. So the cooking, the heating, the parties, the additional smoking element, uh, kind of tends towards a potential for fire hazards. Uh, we would recommend some things. I, I would encourage you not to wait for this free smoke detector. I think it would be the perfect gift under the tree. Mm -hmm. They talk about the best present for a loved one at home. That would be it. Are there any kind you especially would recommend? Uh, anything that's been approved. Mm -hmm. They're all approved by uh, the appropriate laboratories. And if you look for the approval label on it, you'll, you can pick up mm -hmm. one that would be a uh, benefit to you. What's the approximate cost? They range uh, anywhere from about $5 and up, depending how sophisticated. Uh, somewhere between $5 and $12. Now, is there any rule of thumb about how many in a house? The, yes. The, in fact, the uh, rule of thumb is generally one for every level of the home. So mm -hmm. if you're in a two-story home, they would expect at least one on the first level, one on the second level, one in the basement level if you have it. And the one at the second level or first level would even be more beneficial right outside the, the uh, sleeping quarters mm -hmm. or bedroom. Near a stairwell? Yes, nurse stairwell would be good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, see if we have anything else we can think of here. Uh, I was um, I'm going to ask you, in the, as in the short time we have, if you um, see any. Well, let me rephrase it. We we are near the run the often depending on the wind, I guess the flight patterns for Cleveland Hopkins and the landing, and also we're near Russia Township Airport. And we've never had a disaster of a crash in Oberlin or in the area, for that matter, that I know, except some accidents at the at the airport, I believe itself. Uh, would we be able to muster help pretty quickly, uh, given our uh, system here? Would you be confident that we could rather quickly rally the help that we need? The services that we would need, yes. I feel confident that with the mutual aid agreements that we have in effect, uh, with the, uh, the known history of the Emergency Management Association in the area and the Red Cross's response history, mm -hmm. that we would have sufficient personnel and equipment and specialized people ready to come in and assist us mm -hmm. in, in working with that particular type of disaster. So you hope it never happens. <laughs> I, I We've been very lucky not. here without that kind of thing happening or serious storm damage, really, in many, many yes. years. And, uh, we can keep our fingers crossed on this, but it's good to know we have resources if we need them. Uh, do you have any final thing you would like to say? Anything to the citizens of Oberlin? Or to yes, I, I would like to thank those that I have uh, had occasion to meet so far for a, a very warm welcome. I would like to wish everybody a happy holidays and a safe holidays. Mm -hmm. Fine. Thank you so much.
And uh, we thank you all very much for tuning in tonight on Conversation with Lothrop, and we look forward to having you joining us in January when we will have another guest uh, uh, for uh, an interview. Thanks again, and a very happy holiday to everybody. <laughs>